I, I think I, I just started my recording. Okay, we already got we already got people asking questions. So, oh, you know. All right, so we're live. Uh, happy Friday, everybody! Coming to you here from uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Uh, we have with us, uh, you know, uh, distinguished uh, uh, PhD economist uh, Dr. Ted Jones. Uh, from uh, Stuart Title, uh, he's he's a senior vice president over with Stuart uh, and an economist that has a real hands and pulse on the on the economy. Um, so Dr. Jones is going to be coming to South Florida and do a couple of live presentations, but because of uh, the current uh, situation, we decided to hold this uh, live. And and I know that you know things have changed day by day. Uh, so Dr. Jones took over and uh, updated his presentation, and the presentation is called "The Beat Goes On," which literally it's that's what it is. He has a lot of wonderful data, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of information for you to keep calm, uh, understand what's going on. Uh, so with further further ado, I want to thank everybody that's watching live so far. And uh, Ted, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing? By the way, it's an honor to be here. Wish we were down at the beach having a cold one instead of talking about this topic, but uh, we all need to know about this stuff. Yes, 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 we do. Yes, we do. But hey, the beat goes on. And I hope in about 30 days, we'll be able to do that. And we'll get, uh, we'll get uh, Carolyn or Carlos to pay for that. I think you're right on the money on that one. We'll hold Carolyn and Carlos to that. You bet. <laughs> yeah. So are you are you at home uh, by choice or you or or, or... well I'm I'm actually in the office here. Our, our Stuart Title's global headquarters is in Houston, Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm on the floor. I think there's about ten thousand square feet on this floor. I think the CEO is here. Okay. The the um, our head of the technology CTO is here. Our HR person is here, and I'm here. So we each have about twenty five hundred square feet to ourselves. Okay. Kind of like the four corners of the building with the way actually the layout is. So. Uh, I guess you could say we're, uh, we're, we're isolating ourselves rather well, but uh, I come here just because of the bandwidth. <laughs> I'm trying to do this in my neighborhood. I'm thinking about it at home, but I've, all my neighbors are home, and the bandwidth kind of goes down occasionally. So as important as this topic is, we figured we'd just come on in here and we'll make sure we don't have a shutdown in the interim. Okay. All right. So you, you have put this presentation at the beginning of the year called The Beat Goes On. It was supposed to talk about what was forecast for 2019. Um, and then, uh, you know, I, I have my, you know, I still have my invitation sitting on my, on my desk. Yep, yep. Uh, and then, uh, and then this, uh, this pandemic, uh, has, you know, has sort of creeped up on us. Um, and, you know, so I know you have adapted the presentation. Uh, so you, you want to walk us through it. On, and when you, when you chose this name, the beat goes on, even with this event right now, what, uh, what, what, what do you think, uh, it's going to happen to not just to the real estate industry, to our economy, economy and how do we, and how do we come out of here? So I'm a commercial appraiser by trade. I used to be chief economist for Texas A&M's Real Estate Center. I've been steer title chief economist for 23 years this week. So I know a lot about real estate. I've appraised everything. I was chairman of the Houston Association of Realtors back in 2004 and was the largest real estate group in the country. If you have a PhD in finance, minor statistics, and that gives you the right to pay $10 per beer at any airport you go to. That's all that says. But I feel fortuitous that I picked this, uh, this topic this year, and the beat goes on, because um, it talks about what changes, what stays the same, and what's to come. And who would imagine, when I picked this topic last October for 2020, that this is what was to come? But that said, I want to talk to a few. We're going to talk about change to begin with up front. And so, uh, you know, one of my favorite change ones I talk about uh, on this one, this is for the men online. I know every lady that's watching this is rolling their eyes as we speak negatively. But men, if you want to heat up your pizza and not have it soggy, take that toaster, stick it on the end, and click away. Now, Ernesto, don't you think that's brilliant? Don't that's a brilliant idea. <laughs> there you go. I'm going to patent that now. I'm going to call it the pizza, <laughs> the pizza, the pizza warmer. Yeah, the next one I want to talk about change, and, and this change really applies to your business, your, your brokerage business as much as anywhere. On the left-hand side, that's IBM's first 10 megabyte hard drive. Uh, they had a 5 megabyte hard drive that literally took five men to move, but this 10, that's a two-foot diameter platter. They were removable. That's, that blank platter alone cost $36,000. 
in uh, 1960. That's 311,000 a day. On the right-hand side, that little blue thing next to the iPhone, that's the new 480 gigabyte solid state drive. Less than $70. It's, it's just like your business. You still sell real estate, but we use different models. We still store data, but we use different devices. And I figure that's a good analogy. Talk about things are changing. Our millennials, the oldest millennials this year turn 40. <laughs> we always heard millennials wouldn't buy homes for the sixth year in a row last year, according to the National Association of Realtors. Number one, the home buying segment in the United States of America, but they're no longer the new kid on the block. When you're 40, whether you want to or not, you're an adult. I yes. mean, we could get away with it in the 30s, but when you're 40, we're sitting there. And, and that's going to change a lot of stuff, too. I want to equate what we're talking about is beer, because and, and most of us can relate to beer. I'm, I'm going to do that. I grew up on a ranch in southwestern Colorado, Montrose, Colorado, cheap ranch. We used to raise malt barley for Coors, and uh, we, I, normally I would have a, a six-pack of Coors long next year, but, but I'm gonna, you'll see why I'm using Pabst. Now, this is the conventional form we sold beer, and then that was the conventional economy, and that's a conventional way you used to sell real estate. People would, uh, I'm going to go back a long time ago, people would uh, walk into your office if you were a realtor or a broker or agent, you would pull out your paper MLS booklet. Ernesto, do you remember those days at all? Actually, yeah, so, so I've been doing this for 26, going to be 27 years, so when I jumped in the industry, at that moment is when the MLS jumped into DOS. Yeah. So I was lucky enough that I was able to have a dial tone uh, modem and be able to get logged into the MLS. But most of, I don't want to call them the old timer, the season agents were waiting for that Friday book that arrived every Friday. And that, but by the way, in small towns, they printed that book once a month. Oh my so God. You talk about how things change. So we all remember the six, I can remember though, the, the innovation when I was a teenager was the 16 ounce six pack. Is that way, if anyone asks how much you drink, well, you say, well, we split a six-pack. They're thinking you just drink three beers each. You actually drink four beers each. That was innovation. But, but things changed. In those days, those 16-ounce cans were steel. If you drew, drove your vehicle over that steel can, you could knock the alignment out of the front. They were just solid steel cans. Of course, then we all remember, you know, the, the, the cases. Have you seen the latest in packaging from PBR, from Pops for the Ribbon? No, they, no. They've got Second year in a row, here it is, and I'm not making this up. This is a family pack, and, and it's not, and you gotta love it. And, and that's, that's how it, it's, that's kind of like the iBuyer version if you think about it. It's yeah. like, whatever it is. Still selling real estate, folks. We're still selling real estate. Now, talk about how things change. It's gotta be the ironic photo of the year. Ordered online, air freighted in, and delivered by horse drawn carriage in historic areas of New England. Isn't that amazing? Oh, of course. And since we have all this home delivery today, I couldn't pass this one up. You're, I know you've never seen it, but there is a very rare white albino UPS truck out there. And, you know, finally getting some genetic diversity out there. This, you know, all right, laugh away, laugh away. One of my friends, when I picked out my topic, each year sends me a photo. And I think this came from some uh, bar, restaurant, restroom. I would never pull out my phone and take a picture in a public restroom, but I thought that was really appropriate, very innovative. That is a very, very creative, a uh, very creative bathroom, by the way. <laughs> well, I love it. In fact, I, I don't know if my wife would go for this, but I think it'd be cool. You know, if I lived in Nashville, that'd be a good one to have. Yes, yes, yes. I, I got my topic. I give about 150 of these presentations, sometimes up to 200 a year. Every year, the end of January, beginning of February, I'm in Alaska. I speak for realtors groups for Stuart Title, Alaska Land Title Association, some of our agents like in Yukon Title up in Fairbanks. And every year in, in Anchorage, they have the ceremonial start of the Iditarod. It's, it's during fur rendezvous. That's when the fur trappers bring in their pelts and hides from the bush. They dox them off. They also have a big ice carving festival. A couple of years ago, Hard Rock, they're entering the ice carving festival was this drum set. And I thought, got to do this someday. And the beat goes on. And I thought, well, I thought originally since this was going to be election year, the beat goes on would be a great topic. Now, now, oh, well, this is from a tree hugger, friends. Got to say something for the tree huggers. We all have some of them. And we're going to say this up front. We all need to leave this world a better place where it's not. It will go from there. But that said, let's talk about Sonny and Cher. And... The, the great, I call them philosophers of 1967, and I want you to listen to the words now. Unfortunately, the music isn't going to be synced with the sound, but here we go. So, Speak alone. Speak alone. 
some time on this one and show you this thing and we'll talk about the words. You look at these words. The beat goes on. I, when I say phenomenal words, I don't mean la di da di da la di da di dee but look at these. Charleston was once the rage of the dance. We still dance, we just don't Charleston. History's turned the page. History's changed the area. Many skirts were the current thing in those days. It was 1967. I hope I live long enough for many skirts to make the comeback. That's all I can say on this one. Teeny boppers are newborn king. That was our millennials, but with them, the oldest one is turning 40. It's now our Gen Z. And that's what we're always going to have. We're always going to have a new generation where ours have changed. But I want to set the stage where we were, and then I'm going to tell you where we're going to go, I think. Uh, good news. When we entered this thing, and, and, and by the way, think about this. This was three weeks ago. This is the jobs report from February, and it was phenomenal. We had 273,000 net new jobs. 2.41 million in the last 12 months. We got more jobs any time in history. And, and, and not only do we have more jobs, well, well, first of all, job growth. I want to tell you how good that job growth was. Last 40 years, the average annual compound growth rates 1.3%. In the last 12 months, it's 1.6%. We were growing jobs at 23% above the 40-year average. Oh, and historically, as countries get older, Regardless, they grow slower, and we're actually we're growing it well above the rate. Another great thing, we good news when we entered this downturn, that uh, we were growing just not jobs but wages. Our wages, our average hourly wage in February compared to a year ago was up three percent. Mm -hmm. In comparison, that's twenty five percent greater than the average increase in the last ten years. So you can look at this green graph on the right hand side. You can you can see that. Uh, the last 18 months, we've had the best wage increase we've had in the last 10 years. Uh, I've always said this, and, and I want you to all keep, them, keep your eye on this one. I call it my blood pressure test if we were heading to recession. Now, let, let me put this in perspective. Up till now, we were in the longest economic expansion that we've ever been in the United States of America. Economic expansions don't die of old age. They die of an event. 9-11 was an event which, by the way, didn't cause the recession. We were already in a recession for the dot-com inflation. Uh, you think about it, the last big recession we had, which was the worst of our lifetimes thus far. We hope it's still the worst of our lifetimes. In 2008, that recession ran into to 2009. But I've always said that the, the real key indicator, my blood pressure test, is what employment, leisure, and hospitality is doing. You and I don't spend money on leisure and hospitality unless we feel good about the future. I'm talking cruises and vacations and dinners and expensive, you know, events, sporting events, spas, resorts, the whole thing. I guarantee you this number disappears, this thing. We were growing jobs at much greater rate than the U.S., 2.4% leisure and hospitality and 1.6%. Now, I want to show you what Hurricanes Irma and Harvey did to us. Of course, I live in Houston, y'all are in Florida. You, you can see we recovered rather quickly from that. For us, it was a horrendous event. We were only a component of the country. Now, I'm going to disagree with everyone on, on the media today thus far. They're saying we're in a recession. And here's where I disagree. The official definition of recession is two or more quarters of negative GDP. As you can see, and by the way, GDP is the total value of all the goods and services we produce. Mm -hmm. It's an adjusted for inflation. you got to make that count. Last year, we didn't start a recession. Here's Goldman Sachs forecast. But you would know this if you followed me on Twitter, because I tweeted this out early this week. DRTCJ is my Twitter handle. And I, I expect at least 100 of you all to follow me today, DRTCJ, on this. I'm one Ooh. of those. I'm one of those uh, solid followers. Well, I appreciate it. In fact, I, I, I can't thank you enough for that. And, you know, I don't talk politics, and I don't joke. I literally just talk economics or real estate. Economic okay. numbers, 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 solid Thanks. numbers. That's what I do, Ernesto. Anyway, first quarter, we had two great months this quarter, and we're going to have this horrendous March. So go down 5% and notice 
Goldman's forecasting Q3 up 3%. That is amazing. Now, I think we might have a negative uh, Q3. If we have a negative Q3, then we're officially in recession. If we don't, we're not. Uh, overall, Goldman's saying we're going to be at four tenths of percent this year. I just saw another number this morning that kind of indicated the same. So at least some of the institutional uh, researchers, such as Goldman and, 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 and uh, what have you, are, are looking at a relatively short-lived downturn. I certainly hope they're right on this. Now, i got to go here real quick. I don't understand this toilet paper shortage. I, I, I just don't get it. But I thought this was great humor. Whoever did this was brilliant. If you're going to have a shortage downturn like this, I would expect it to be a beer or wine or whiskey or steaks or something like that, but not toilet paper. I'm, with you, with, I'm with you with the steaks. I don't understand the, the toilet paper, uh, you know, situation. I, I, I don't either, but I thought this was great. Someone else sent me this one, so they're not the only ones in the country that have this on perspective. So I want to take you back. I'm going to praise my trade. We're going to look at what happened in the last two pandemics. In the last seismic event, that would be 9-11. We're going to look at SARS, H1N1, and 9-11. We're going to look at six major statistics, economic so, and, and so real these were, statistics. These were shocks to our economy. These were massive shocks to our economy. You bet. You're looking at the last two pandemics there, the, the SARS being the light blue, H1N1, the swine flu being the yellow, 9-11. And, and notice I'm using annualized data. We all know. The month the hurricane hits, it's hell in a handbasket. We all know the, the month that you hit this stuff that hits your community, it is horrible. But let's look at the long run. And the long run, I'm saying, is year. So I want you to look at what 30-year uh, mortgage rates did from 2000 to 2002. We kind of just continued our trajectory, which says that 9-11 now immediately, 9-11 plunge interest rates down to nothing. They came back, folks. They came back because the economy came back, expectations came back. You, you can, I could argue that there was no structural change in that trend line because of that event. SARS being the same way. Uh, in fact, you would expect if SARS had really hurt the economy, that trajectory would have continued downward at a steeper rate. It would have dropped further. It didn't. It, it actually stabilized. H1N1, these are a little difficult too. Remember in 2008, we had a major Biggest recession you and I have ever seen in our lives. So we got to look at, at not, 09 is just kind of the effect of just H1N1. Again, I'm going to tell you, I don't see any change in trend line. I'm going to tell you, at least in a year duration, while we know each time we did this, the month impacted it, a year when you added it all up, there was really no net change. Don't you find that kind of amazing? No, what, yeah. I, what I find amazing is that the, the 2008-2009 recession and H1N1 were took a place around the same time and how strong we came back out of that. You know, and that's what yes. I, I've been saying to everybody. It's like, listen, yes, this is, this is like Hurricane Andrew for everybody watching me in South Florida. And Hurricane Andrew was a devastating event, but South Florida bounced back unbelievably. I mean, it took three to six months of pain, but it came back stronger and better than ever. Uh, that's we're right. Better building, we're better building codes, we're better infrastructure, we're better everything. So H1 and the and, and the recession came together at the same time. And yes, there was about a year of, of, of pain. But I feel this time our, our federal government is a little bit more prepared to, and, and, it's, and it's being proactive, not reactive like we were back then. That's my humble opinion. I agree with you. Look at this next one. Let's talk home sales, housing sales. We see no change whatsoever in 9-11 and SARS. Now, H1N1, remember the economy, we hit a recession because the housing bubble implosion in 08. Yeah. We actually saw a tiny sale, a recovery in housing sales in 09, and we didn't have our stimulus on housing purchases until 2010. I'm just trying to tell you, if you're saying that event structurally changed from one year to the next, housing sales, it didn't happen. Home prices, same way, folks. Same way. Look, look at this. Trajectory continued upwards in 9-11, upwards in SARS. If anything, you stabilized H1N1. I don't think H1N1 had any impact on the housing market. Although I want to say this, every time we have a major event like these things, we spend a lot more time at home and we value our home that much more. I think there's a large number of people that are saying, thank heavens, I have my own house right now. And a large number of people are saying, man, I wished I had my own house instead of living in this apartment project with all these people. <laughs> so I think if anything, it adds value to our, our housing stock in our own minds. This is the unemployment rate. 
again, it, it was rising through 9-11. It kind of flatlined in SARS. It, 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 was, it was rising dramatically in 08 because of the recession. And again, it, it kind of almost topped out the year afterwards. Just trying to show you, commercial real estate sales, uh, much the same thing. Now, commercial sales plummeted in uh, 08, 09. That's because there was no lending. We had no liquidity on commercial real estate. And then I want to show you the, uh, the cap rates. Commercial cap rates are a, fun, are a measure of risk. The higher the cap rate, the greater the risk. And, and you just don't see a big increase in risk taking place. I think the H1N1 went up only because the recession, I don't think it had anything to do with that. Now, I want to show you this. These are the latest morning's numbers. And, and I want to put everyone in perspective, and, and you got to listen to me all out on this one. In the world, as of this morning, in the entire world, we've had 200, less than 250,000 coronavirus cases recorded. Now, I'm willing to bet you that's dramatically underreported. Uh, first of all, China may have lied. China says that they had 82,000 cases. In a minute, I'll say let's say they had that 10 times more. What we know is correct, though, that we've had 10,064 people in the world, in the world, die thus far of coronavirus. So let's look what happened to H1N1 just in the United States. I want to put this in perspective because I, th I think we've lost a complete gauge of distance and measure. In 2009 in the U.S., we had 60.8 million swine flu cases. 274,000 people in the U.S. alone were hospital. 12,500 died. My goodness. In the world, we've had 247,000 cases of coronavirus. Now, let's say it's, it's an 88,000 in China. Let's say China lied by a factor of 1,000%. They've underestimated the number of cases by ten, tenfold. That means 880,000 Chinese have had this. Now, we know the death rate's not understated. But so 880,000 Chinese, China has 1.4 billion people. You're not even talking a million out of 1.4 billion. I'm just trying, and we hope, we hope that we don't even get the swine flu, but we've got massive ways to go. If you think about that on the swine flu, I want to put this in perspective. We hope, we hope coronavirus is only as severe as a swine flu, it well could be less. What, what do you think of this one, Ernesto? Had you seen these numbers compared side well, by I, side? I, I, has, I has seen the numbers, uh, you know, but when you, when you put them like this together, you, you know, you see the, 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 the swine flu was, you know, it was, it was a larger, you know, it was, it, was, it, was a, it was a larger event. It was a larger, you know, the, 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 a black swan. Uh, and, I don't, and I felt that back then, you know, it, no government was as ready as we are right now. Uh, I agree. So I, I think that, you know, although there's, there's a lot of concerns right now, um, you know, and, and everybody watching, th this presentation is going to be made available and shared with everybody. So you can share it with your clients and, and, and your prospective clients so you can, so you can share numbers and data. Uh, but if you, if you look at a, a swine and 9-11 and H1N1, all of these, all of these uh, other events that, you know, the, the real estate, which, you know, but most people watching are in the real estate industry, the real estate did not contract. As a matter of fact, there is the real estate boom right after, uh, you know, the, the dot-com crash, it was one of those things that the real estate market surged tremendously after the dot-com crash. Everybody thought it was going to, you know, something out that was going to happen. Uh, so I tell everybody, you know, Wall Street is not the real estate market. It's, it's two different right. economies. You know, it's a completely different economy. But when you look at these numbers, I mean, it's, it's heartbreaking the, 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 the amount of life lost. But when you put it into perspective, it's, it's, it's you know, it's minimal. minimal. Right. So retail sales. Now, we, we got the, both the yin and the yang, the good and the bad on retail sales. Retail sales make up 68% of GDP. I'm willing to bet that uh, Amazon, Costco, and Walmart just had the best first quarter in the history of their lives. All the sales, and we've only been doing this for a month, not even a full month. But remember, our retail sales on the other side, everything else has gone down. And car sales, uh, the only person in the world has got to be a BMW or a Chevrolet car salesman today, without question, or, or a person that's selling uh, cruise ship slots. I want to show you on this but, one. Uh, but touching, touching on car sales, uh, uh, GMC just announced today, 84 months, zero interest, no down payment on GMC vehicles. So they're gonna, there's going to be a line of people as soon as this next 10, 15 days are over, you know, they've been wanting to trade up their vehicles. Because, I mean, 84, 84 months, zero interest, that's, you know, it's free money from GMC. Yeah. 
I think he. Yeah. So you, you look at where uh, job growth has been, and this is the latest data that were available until right now of this morning, but uh, Florida, you're the sixth best job growth place in the entire United States of America. Part of that, this, this next slide, I want to show you this, why Florida is doing so well. This is data, annual data for the Tax Foundation. They're a not-for-profit research group out of Washington, D.C. They look at five taxes by state, corporate income tax, personal income tax, retail sales tax, unemployment tax, and property tax. Florida is the fourth best place in the United States of America to do business in tax-wise. Now, one, two, and three don't count because nobody's moving there. Best place tax-wise to do business is Wyoming, and yet they're losing jobs because their primary business is coal. Second best place is South Dakota. Nice people, don't get me wrong, but it's South Dakota. Third best place is Alaska, and the Alaska economy is cratering as we speak. Y'all don't understand the cat bird seat that Florida sits in right now. Great tax environment, a place where many, many people want to live. Uh, I want to show you, this is the latest job numbers as of this morning from, Fort, uh, from Miami, Fort Lauderdale, West Palm Beach. Job growth a little over 1%. You added 28,300 net new jobs in the 12 months ending January. You can see all more jobs any time in history. But one of the reasons that your job growth hasn't been as high as it's been in the past is, is the, are these data. This is unemployment numbers as of January 2020. Um, in the U.S., we're 3.4%. Let me put that in perspective. The Federal Reserve says we've reached full-time employment when unemployment is between 5 or 5.5% 5 .5 or less. Here in Miami, unemployment rate's 2.2%. Your unemployment rate, well, the reason you can't grow more jobs is nobody left to hire. Yeah, there's nobody else to hire. Yeah, we... <laughs> in, fact, in fact, I love saying this. I said, your unemployment rate is so low, my brother-in-law could get a job in Miami. <laughs> now, he probably couldn't keep it, but he could get it, if you know what I mean. So th this is how starved you are for talent for people with skill sets that are needed. So uh, what a great position on a downturn to go into that we're doing this. Uh, very, very important to us. Um, I, this is a new one again. Again, this is the latest numbers. This is what I call a super sector analysis because in a downturn, we already know our big hit ones are gonna be leisure, hospitality, transportation, right? You agree with me? Those are the sectors. So what I've done here, I've looked at the percent of all jobs in Miami and the US. And let's just zoom in. Let's, let's just come down to leisure and hospitality. In the U.S., it's 10.7% of all jobs. In Miami, MSA, it's 12.4%. Miami's going to feel this recession worse than the U.S. on average. You've got more leisure and hospitality. You've got a lot more uh, trade transport and utilities. By the way, a lot of that transports aircraft, a lot of it's cruise ships. And those are going to be difficult businesses for you all to come out of. So now, it, the, the good news is it's not some of the higher paying jobs. If, if you look at some of the higher paying jobs, education and health services, I would almost expect an increase in that in Miami on the medical side. Uh, and then I look at the 12 month job growth, where you're going or where you're not. And Ernesto, as I told you, I'll get you this PDF and, and you can distribute as you see so as desired. How's that sound? That sounds good. Thanks. Afterwards. Uh, one of the things I always want to look at, and when we're going to talk about real estate, is we go into a downturn. If we had overbuilt before we hit the downturn, just as we had, in 08 and 09, it makes that downturn that much deeper and that much more severe. So let's look at the housing market right now. And I'm gonna do it in a pure simple firm way. I'm gonna look at total new supply and total new demand since 2013. On the left-hand column, net new jobs, that's the total number of new jobs for those seven years, 2013 through 2019. In Miami MSA, we created 417,600. We permitted, uh, from, this is from apartments to condos to houses to mansions. It's everything. Every new dwelling unit, 137,632. We have slightly over three new jobs per new dwelling unit. Now, you think about it. A typical apartment has about one and a half new jobs. If it's, your, if it's a one-bedroom apartment, you got one new job per new dwelling unit. You all have three. So what's going to help soften this blow to any de decreased demand as real estate is that we had under underbuilt this market for the last seven years. Yeah, yeah so that's great. When, when we go back to OA, we had an oversupply before the the contraction took place. We're going into this because I mean, realistically speaking, everybody watching, we're we're gonna go through some pain because although, but what, what the, the figures we're talking about is we're we're, we're walking into the storm world prepare and world stock we don't have exactly. an oversupply we don't have an oversupply or, or inventory or real estate or new construction or resale we have a very strong job market 
So yes, we're, we're going to go from two to maybe 10, but we're not going to go from two to 40. You know, exactly right. And that's why, so, so you know, there, we have some, we've got some good tailwinds that are going to take us out of this. Now, one of the things that surprised everyone, this is each week, Freddie, Freddie Mac's the keeper of interest rates. They're the official, they have a primary mortgage market survey. They were reporting it once weekly since April of uh, 1971. If you ever want to compare interest rates, you go to that. You see the last two weeks, first of all, three weeks ago, we hit the lowest 30-year conventional fixed rate loan rate we've seen in history of the United States of America. In the last two weeks, it went up. And people keep scratching saying, well, we're going to get negative rates. You and I talked about this. Yeah. We're not going to get negative rates in the United States of America. Do you want to comment on that one, Ernesto? Yeah, I don't, I don't think, uh, I think the Federal Reserve is used as much as they were going to use for interest rates. I think point, point quarter is it's, it's the baseline for, for the U.S. We have a lot of other tools, a lot of other liquidity, a lot of other uh, bond buying programs or a lot of other things that we can do. We don't, we, we won't have to go negative to stimulate the economy. We have a lot of, a lot of stuff. And talking about low rates, uh, we, I saw, I mean, it's like 26 years doing this, I saw an FHA close at 278. Wow. I have never in my life seen this. I mean, I have to look at that again and again and again because, I mean, that, that one buyer got a gift, a very good gift there. Amen, amen. So, so, so Ted, where do, you see, where do you see rates? Uh, let's, let's, let's get past this June, July. Where do you see rates uh, in what range? All right, so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you mine in a minute. Yeah. Here's, where, here's where Fannie's at and here's where MBA's at. And by the way, I respect both these organizations. Doug Duncan and I got our PhDs together. Doug's the chief economist for Fannie Mae. Fannie Mae and the NBA can't even agree on what rates were last year. <laughs> Fannie Mae says they have a 3.9% average for the year. NBA says 3.7. Fannie says they're going to drop down to 3.1. NBA says they're going to grow to 4. Uh, I think it's going to be kind of in between. I think we're going to be looking at a, a year from now between that 3.6 and 4% somewhere in there, probably skewed towards 3.6%. One of the reasons, let me back up. One of the reasons that rates went up so much the last two weeks is this proposed massive spending bailout. So we're going to be borrowing several trillion dollars at the federal government level. And a lot of the investment banking community says, you know what, you borrow that much money, you lever up that much based on what your income is, you're no longer as good a risk as you were. So what they've done is it kind of cut us from a triple A rating to a double A rating with the world. Yeah. And that intrinsic increase has been in every interest rate. It's been in corporate bonds and muni bonds. It's been in treasuries. You and I talked about that this morning on the treasuries and what have you. So, so rates, I, I think they're going to go up a little bit. I, I don't, in my, I do, I do not anticipate negative rates in the U.S. for this one reason. Unlike the European countries or Japan or even Russia, we are still growing in population. If you, if you were like Rip Van Winkle and you went to sleep in Japan or Italy or Germany or Poland or, or Russia, a year later when you woke up, there would be fewer people living there. That means you have less demand for real estate. We just don't have that problem. Now. Next one, and I noticed on the on the, the my MB, MS, excuse me, uh, CNBC. While we're talking, we had NAR release their housing sales number. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna talk about January because I know what these numbers are, and I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you all this. Just ignore whatever NAR says about housing sales. Not just this month. I want to ignore what they said in January. I even wrote a blog on it in January. I said pick a number, and, and the reason is. We got to look at the proper numbers. NAR, their January headline was housing sales dropped 1.3 percent. They didn't. Their own number stated that the total number of existing homes closed in January of this year were 318,000. A year ago, it was 285,000, which says to me housing sales that realtors got paid on, that lenders got paid on, and title companies closed like Stuart Title up 11.6 percent. The headline was down 1.3 percent. That's because NAR always likes to look at, and they, they compare the seasonally adjusted annualized rate of sales, which is a formula. It, it's not actual closings that actually occur that month. That goes into it, but it's not that. And they compare, for example, this number, seasonally adjusted annualized rate of sales in January 2020 compared to December 2019, and that is not what impacts your business. So I'm going to do it differently. This, this black line, we're, we're going to do the U.S. They're going to drill down to the Miami MSA, both houses, single family and condo. 
is the total number of homes closed the prior 12 months. It is not the seasonally adjusted annualized rate. Now, you can see the last eight months, we were, shooting, we we're blowing and going, folks. Absolutely, really well. The blue bars in the background, that's simply the median price. Um, you can see the huge seasonality we have. We have top prices every June in the U.S. on average. We have bottom prices in January, February. You look at those chart, this chart, though, and there's, I got the Ricky Ricardo moment here. Because how do I explain? Well, all right. Why did home sales go down from mid-2017 to mid-2019? And that's where Ricky Ricardo says, Lucy, you got some explaining to do. So I'm going I'm to explain. Now, any I would tell you it was affordability. I'm going to say bull. I'm going to make a statement that some people are going to think I'm nuts, but you got to listen to the whole deal. In general, housing's affordable for most people, okay. but not the way they spend their money. And, and I'm going to use an example. Uh, one of my favorite tweets in January, I took it from USA Today from the money section. And they talked about dry January. Now, i got to explain to people what dry January is because some people don't know. Dry January is when you drink so much alcohol in December from the holidays, you take January off from drinking to save yourself, to help, help re re rejuvenate your liver and everything else like that. Normally, you read about dry January in the lifestyle section of the healthcare section. And here it was in the financial section of USA Today. And the reason it was is they noted that the average millennial spends $300 a month on alcohol. Each time they go out drinking, on average, they spend $56 a, month, a, a night. Now, that's per millennial. So let's do a millennial couple. The, the, between the two of them, they're spending $600 a month on alcohol. They spend more on coffee. So now let's take that millennial couple. Let's just say it's the same as coffee. That's $1,200. One of my first speeches this year was in Austin, Texas. Had a young lady in Austin. And I said, housing is affordable for most. And she just shook her head violently left and right. And, and, and then when I explained this thing about this thing, she said, you know, that's what my husband and I said in that. You, you've nailed us. We spend $1,200 a month on alcohol and coffee, but you forgot. And I thought, oh, no, here it comes. You forgot that our cable TV bill and subscription service for the internet subscription is $414 a month. You add that 414 to the 1200, they're spending 1600 plus a month on coffee, alcohol, and TV. Yeah. And she made a comment. She says, I now realize we can probably afford almost any house that we would like to buy. But when I was in Alaska, I had an attorney that had just come from counseling a couple, probably going to lose their home. They were spending $900 a month on Red Bull and cigarettes. So I'm going I'm to say this again. Housing is not affordable for some people, but for many it's affordable, but they claim it isn't because the way they spend their money. I, I, I agree with you there. I, I totally agree with you. I, I think also our market, uh, you know, South Florida, is, is, it's, 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 it's the, the ocean on one side, the Everglades on the other, so we're very limited in inventory. Right. But I think that, you know, our sales contract also because of that. There, there's, I mean, we're, we're, we're going into this with less than, 3.6 uh, months of supply of inventory. Uh, I mean that you, you need uh, you need six to eight to have a healthy balance. We, we economists think six months is normal. normal. And anytime anytime it's five months or less, it's a seller's market. Anytime it's seven months or more, it's a buyer's market. And it's it remains a seller's market today. Yeah. yeah. So this happens to be the Miami MSA, and this is Florida Realtors data. Thank you, Florida Realtors, and the realtor that sends this data to me along. That black line again is total single family sales in the prior 12 months. We had a nice run. You look at the last 12 months, it's been just going up rather nicely. Median price continues to go up. It's starting to top out a little bit there. That could be an affordability thing because we're drinking too much. And, you know, well, you get it all that good yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Here's condo townhouse sales. Uh, that's a different, different market. And of course, y'all built a lot, but but again, you can see prices going up. So I want to I want to dissect this in a minute. First of all, I throw this for any of y'all out there. This new chart I came up with this year, I want to show you the percent of all single-family homes in the last six years that closed each of these months. The blue on the bottom and the blue bar is the U.S. The white on the top is Miami. Uh, MSA, Miami, Fort Lauderdale, West Palm. You actually sell more of your homes in January, February, March, April than the U.S. does. You yeah. see that in December. So your season starts in December, if you think about this. Now, the, one of the reasons that's good for it, I think we're going to have a little bit of delay in some closings in March and April. 
and, and the reason I think we're going to do that is um, we have some homeowners that don't want to show their homes and some buyers that don't want to go through. If we look at those numbers I showed you before the last two pandemics and 9-11, our housing sales didn't go down because of the event. So again, Miami's on the top. You can see your housing sales, uh, uh, when they peak, they peak in June. Uh, kind of intriguing. This happens to be a townhouse condo sales. Um, again, season starts in December and carries in, and May's kind of your peak. You, you remember the U.S. peaks in, in June, July, August. You're just a little out of, out of sync on this type of thing, but that's actually good for y'all. That's no problem. I'm not so, so, uh, so then what my take from these two graphs is the, this pause in the system is going to carry us those to June, July. It, it's going to... I believe they are. I talked to our, our our buddy Carlos this morning, and he, he says that our order counts for Stuart Tile are hanging in there well thus far in March, but we do anticipate a little bit of slowdown in orders coming in, but not for the year. Low, uh, up front, low interest rates are starting to help make up for much of what's going on today in the housing field. We have another one coming up on energy. So now let's talk about, you know, what's not affordable is not, not just owning a home, but housing period. The average rent, and oh, by the way, if you're gonna buy a home any place in the country, no matter where you're at, if you wanna look at listings, you go to realtor.com. You can search listings online any place in the country. If you wanted to rent a major apartment in a big project any place in the country, you go to Rent Cafe. And so I, I went to Rent Cafe at uh, two or three o'clock this morning. Average rent in the Miami MSA is $1,703. That's probably a one or two bedroom. That's a one bedroom, yeah. One bedroom, right? They're up, the rents are up 3% year over year. The average apartment's 889 square feet. You can see what the mix is. So then, and these are single family here. What I did is I said, all right, let's look at today's interest rates. And let's look, and I love this one. And, and our median price, this is single family. I got condos coming up. So at $1,703, if your rate is 3.66%, you, and if you put 20% down, don't worry, we got FHA coming up. Yeah. You're borrowing 290, your principal and interest payments 1332, you still have $371 a month to apply for taxes and insurance. Do you realize if you can save 20% down, you can probably, for the same payment per month you're making for an apartment, own the typical house in the Miami MSA. That's phenomenal. Don't you think so? Yeah, no, and, and three, oh, six, three, three, six, there's still inventory in Miami, they kind of, and then Dave Brown and Palm Beach, there's still plenty of inventory at that 360 target. There is, it's not like there isn't, there's, yeah. there's still inventory. Well, you're not going to get in, you know, in, in uh, Coral Gables, you're not going to get, you know, that area, but there is inventory. I threw in the FHA, um, basically it says you can pay the principal and interest. If you want to pay tax insurance, you're going to have to give up your uh, coffee and your alcohol. Yeah. Or, or part of it thereabouts. Here's <laughs> condo. Now, to condos are different because, yeah, you, condos are different. Uh, we, we got a median price there of 200100 bucks. We all know we got a condo fee, and my estimate is that condos are between 40 and 60 cents a square foot per month. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, Rough pretty way? much. Oh, by the way, uh, even though I'm from Houston, Texas, I'm going to challenge y'all realtors. If you want to make your listings more effective to buyers, you need to put our, our monthly condo or homeowner's fee per square foot per month so people can compare units across the board. Y'all need to do that. That's a good tip. So I'm writing just, that just one a down. Heads up thing on so that said, on the conventional loan, 200,100 uh, bucks, you got 970 bucks left over for taxes, insurance, and condo fee. We just did it. You could own the typical condo in the Miami MSA if the same price as running a one bedroom apartment. Am I correct? Yeah, yeah. Just shows this. FHA, pretty amazing, folks. Pretty amazing. I, I go back to this thing. People say housing is not affordable. For for many, it's not. For some, it's not. For, for many of us, it is highly affordable. Right, we're going to kind of wrap this thing down a little bit. Commercial real estate, I, I always talk about this. It's kind of an overall hit. You can see we had a major plunge in commercial sales between 07 and 09. Our commercial sales dropped 88%. Had nothing to do with H21. Had everything to do with the recession. You couldn't borrow money. Commercial sales are doing well. And the reason they're doing well, real estate is the last investment we have today that's given us a decent return. 
What you yeah, caught so, me so that that 09 or 10, 11 line, you know, it, it wasn't that there was no buyers. That that was right. not what that, that was not what we were experiencing. We had plenty of investor that wanted to take advantage and buy property. The bank yes. was not lending, which is not the problem that we that we're having now that we're gonna have going forward. It's not that the banks are not gonna lend. You know, it's we had the inventory, we just couldn't get the loan. So Exactly. In fact, the reason that banks are going to lend on commercial real estate, they know, unless it's hotels, uh, I'll take that caveat off the table. I, hotel, restaurants might be a tough sell right now, too, but um, they're going to lend there because it's got great cash flow compared to any other investment we're facing. This happens to be Miami commercial real estate sales. Um, doing really well, folks. Not all time records, but uh, really, really doing well. Now, here's the second component that's going to help us ease this out of this downturn. The first one's lower interest rate. The second one's cheap energy. Now, we all I think we froze there for a second. If everybody else is watching. If you are an oil field worker in western uh, North Dakota, if you're in the oil and gas business in Houston, Texas, which is global headquarters for oil and gas technology, or if you're out in the Permian Basin, you're hurt. Everyone else wins. People because of, we just saw the lowest oil prices we've seen in 18 years yesterday. 21 bucks a barrel. They've gone up, but even then, oh my gosh, I can remember 140 bucks a barrel. I can remember June of 2014, 120 bucks a barrel in a relatively good economy. This is going to put more money in everyone else's pockets, which is awesome. Now, I want to talk about energy real quick, and I just, I just want to tell everyone, if, if you think that at the same time we're going to get away from all of our uh, fossil fuels, yeah, it's not going to happen. This is where all of our energy came from in 2018 in the U.S. On the left-hand side is all renewables. That's 12% of our energy. On the right-hand side is 88%. That's our non-renewables. Now, uranium's non-renewable, but it's not a fossil fuel. But I want to point out our renewables. And there's some people in Washington, D.C. and Congress that say that 10 years now, everything on the left-hand side is going to be all of our energy. It is physically impossible for our lifestyle today, even giving physics. Biomass, two forms of biomass. One of them is uh, or you take your fry oil and you make a synthetic diesel fuel. I have a cousin who owns a, a Mesilla Valley Transport Trucking Company, 1,500 semis on the road every day, Royal has. He has his own uh, synthetic diesel fuel plant for fry oils from McDonald's and everyone else. Loses money on every gallon of diesel fuel he makes, even with the subsidies. That's even not, with not subsidies. even with subsidies. Oh, and, and even more important than that, if we're going to get healthy, we don't want to double our fried oils <laughs> to, to produce more fuel, which are you know plant-based. The other form of biomass we have, you look at our old landfills from 40 and 50 years ago. We put down all that garbage, we covered it with plastic and then dirt. It's been encapsulated, it's anaerobic, uh, oxy, anaerobic uh, decomposition. You're actually producing methane gas. What we're learning is municipalities and counties are going out and drilling those because it's producing so much methane. And well, part of it is if they don't drill them, they might catch fire anyway and burn. And then you have a smolding garbage dump. It stinks like burning garbage at your whole town for the next 10 or 20 years. So they're drilling them and they're using this methane gas to for municipal buildings and other things like that. But we're not gonna double biomass. Well, one of the way to double it is double our landfills and wait 40 or 50 years. That's not gonna do it. Hydro, build a dam, spin a turbine, the most the cheapest form of electrical generation there is in the world is hydro. We'll never build another major hydro project in the United States of America. Uh, and the reason is, if you're going to put in a new dam, you're going to kill an endangered species or create one, and that's not going to be allowed in our, our society today. And in fact, I believe there are three dams in the Pacific Northwest that are scheduled potentially for imminent cutting in the next 10 years. Geothermal. California has some geothermal plants. Think of... Uh, hot springs, what have you. Those hot springs are hot. That If you go deep enough in the earth in that location, the rocks will if you put water next to it, it will really flash the steam. So they drill a hole down those hot rocks, pump water down to it, it turns the steam, drill another relief well, steam shoots out, spins a turbine. California's not gonna give any more uh, geothermal permits. Of course, we don't wanna build one in, in Yellowstone either. So let's look at the two where everyone thinks we're gonna build all of our energy, wind and solar. Think about it. We've been subsidizing wind and solar 
since 1974. One of the studies I said we said we probably subsidized the tune of four trillion dollars. We subsidized wind and solar in 2018. Well, that's to trillions or billions? We, we we subsidized wind and solar. They think since 74 to four trillion. Just in 2018, we subsidized wind and solar installation and new plants to 129 billion. And it's only 3.4% of all of our power today. Now, the, the people on the new Green Deal tell you everything's gonna be wind and solar. So let me tell you about wind energy. Wind energy, max wind turbines produce most of their power in early evening, and it's all about physics. As the sun sets, you get a cooling on one side and it's hot on the other, you get convection currents and you get massive wind flow and hence you get a lot of electricity. Most of the installations though, uh, because we don't use much electricity then, our, our maximum peak electrical loads comes in early to mid afternoon. So you got half the electricity you can't use, it's generated at night, you need to store it through the next day. So we'll just build batteries, right? Well, maybe not, hold on there. Batteries, this is for the Manhattan Institute, it's a think tank, it's kind of like a, a think tank that you've got to tell the whole story. It can't be left or right, it can't be conservative or liberal, it can't be pro-green, pro-oil, it's got to be the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So here's our latest article on batteries. $100,000 worth of Tesla batteries, as good as they get, folks. By the way, Tesla batteries are all built by Panasonic. I've been in the plant, the, the Gigafactory in Reno. But $200,000 worth of Tesla batteries, which weigh over 20,000 pounds, store the same amount of energy as one barrel of oil. That's, that's a direct quote out of their paper. Now, now think about it. A barrel of oil yesterday was 23 bucks, and an empty barrel cost 20 bucks. So for 43 bucks, not only you get the storage device, you get the full energy. I don't think we've ever appreciated how perfect oil has been for a store of energy. Now, I, I think Tesla cars are fun to drive. Um, I can't own one because I often drive from Houston to Dallas and back in a day, it can't go that distance. I, I drive from Houston to Austin today or Houston to Fredericksburg, Texas, where my dad's ranch is. I can't go that distance without charging. I can't get there and back in a day to do it. Fun to drive, but it's not going to work for me. So someone will say, well, just build, build more gigafactories, right? Get this one. The gigafactory in Reno, world's largest battery factory, cost $5 billion. If you took every battery from that factory that was made in a year, and we store electricity for the US, we could store enough electricity for three minutes. Oh, and you say, well, we'll just build more. If you built 5,000 gigafactories, or you built the same one for a thousand years and saved all the batteries from it, you could store enough electricity for two days. Do you understand? We are not gonna be running off of battery energy. In fact. You, you live in Florida and I live in Houston. There's not enough batteries in this world to run my air conditioning overnight. No, and that, no, that's the big no, issue. No. Yeah. I want to talk about China real quick. And, and this, again, is part of this fallout right now that we're seeing with China. So, so for everybody that's asking questions, uh, as soon as we get to the end, you're going to be able, we're going to, we're going to ask those questions. So stay put because, you know, we, we're coming to an end. But uh, I see the questions being asked. They're, they're going to be answered. So stay put. So I want to talk about China, and I don't, want to, I don't want to talk about blame. I mean, yeah, okay, the virus came from China. It is what it is. I want to talk about trade. And this is where the change is coming about. First of all, we had, to have, we had to have a change in our trade with China for an economic reason. I want to take politics off the table completely. Here's what we bought from China in 2018. Here's what China bought from us. Neither of these bother me. That's the same scale, by the way. Here's what we bought from them. Here's what they bought from us. Again, I don't care that we buy five times more from them than they buy from us. That's not the issue. A lot of countries buy more from us than we buy from them. The issue is this, is how the trade, until we just started changing a month ago, is being done. Now, if you've ever been to China, have you been to China, Ernesto? No, no, no I haven't, no. All right, so what will amaze you there if you you're going to see a large number of people driving Buicks down the streets of China, they're the new millionaires. They're the success people. A Buick. If you want to tell everyone that you're successful, you drive a Buick, and I'm not kidding you. <laughs> Buick has effectively Jim's done a phenomenal job, and I mean, if you're the new cutting edge, you're driving the Buick if you're rich. The problem was under the trade rules. When General Motors used to export a Buick to China, it used to, which is a month ago, 
$50,000 vehicle and going in had to pay a 25% tariff. That means that $50,000 wholesale car, when it hit China, had to pay a $12,500 tax. Now, that's, 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 that's 25%. When China shipped up as a motorized vehicle of any kind, the maximum we were allowed to tax it was 2.5%. My goodness, folks, we, we were paying 10 times more taxes than they were paying. Now, so I'm going to do this with your, your and everyone just pick a side. We're going to play the board game Monopoly. You're going to either play for China or for the U.S. I don't care which side you play on. If you're from China, when you pass go, you get 200 bucks. Under these same rules, if you're from the U.S., when you pass go, you get 20 bucks. Who's going to win the game? China. So why are we even playing? That's why we had to change the rules with China. The reason I bring up China, and let me talk about this here, we're got to, going to not just, A, we've evened out the taxes, and even out the trade, they're going to buy more stuff from us. We're going to bring a lot of what we're producing over there back. And I mean, primarily or very quickly, pharmaceuticals. I'm not comfortable buying all my pharmaceuticals from China. I'm just not. I want that made in the U.S., I'll take Germany, I'll take Canada, I'll take Mexico, but I don't want it made in China. That, that's just me. And, and so we're going to see, it, it, look at Apple, Apple Electronics, Apple Computer. They're going to bring a large number of their component, high value component, back to, for example, North America. And that's great news. So let me wrap this up. I expect a recession. Remember, two, more two or more consecutive quarters of negative GDP. Uh, Goldman doesn't, but uh, I think we're out by the end of the year. I hope I'm right on this one. Okay. Good news is going in, we had growing wages and jobs, best job and wage growth, best wage growth in 10 years, folks. Record low rates and cheap energy are going to help bring us out of this. That's great news. Um, and manufacturing, cheap energy begets more manufacturing. And as we bring back more stuff from China, which I think we should, um, the cool thing about manufacturing jobs, if you're in high school, you don't have to go to college to get a degree to have a great career if you got manufacturing. No college debt. And we're going to replace China on a bunch of funds. I have a, I have a Twitter account, DRTCJ. I hope a bunch of y'all signed back up with me on that. I noticed some of you already did on that one. Um, I, want to, I want to talk one thing real quick, because I want to say one thing positive about what we're doing in real estate. I, also, it's, it's a blatant advertising, so let's get on with it. Um, I, own, I hope you've been down to the U.S. Virgin Islands. This is St. John, Maho Bay. Like last time, my wife and I snorkeled across here. Uh, we, we quit counting at 12 turtles over two and a half feet in diameter halfway across. St. John's so unique because 60% of St. John's a national park, which is pretty phenomenal. Now, that's Cruise Bay where you go in, and I actually own a unit there in one of those things. But let me tell you how we bought the unit because this is what's exciting about real estate today. For those y'all in the brokerage business in particular, we went and looked at this unit last, and we've been going down there since mid eighties, owned some property with other people and what have you, but went in there last uh, July with my realtor. And the only time you can show a unit when it's not occupied or rented. So these are rented by the week. It's called Gallows Point Resort. Rented by the week and uh, the person checked out on Sunday morning at 1030. So going with my realtor at 1030 in the morning, he's got his iPad. We walked through in 10 minutes and yeah, I made an offer. Yeah, it was below the asking price. So he, he typed it up on his iPad. I clicked the DocuSign button. It went off to the listing realtor. Um, and then he, he put the iPad down. He put his cell phone on the countertop and he called the listing realtor on Sunday morning about 1040 in the morning. He told her, I said, I just sent you an offer on this, uh, this unit. Um, and she says, great. I just got off the phone with the owner. The owner was a doc out of uh, New Jersey who was on vacation in Italy. And he just called to see how his sales were going. And the sale of this unit was going. She called him up, he made a counter, came to us. We accepted the counter. It, it, what's amazing, imagine this, a couple from Texas bought a investment property, it's a good income producing property in St. John, from a couple in New Jersey, who was vacation in Italy and start to finish, it was a 21 minute transaction. The only time I signed my name was about three weeks after closing when I was in my attorney's office in St. John. He said, if you sign here, I'll give you a copy of your closing documents. That's where we're going. Remote online notaries, everything else, folks, you cannot believe our future. And why this is important to uh, realtors and real estate specialists, brokers and agents, 
you no longer are just a cab driver. You're now providing value added negotiation and search tools. That's your, your best displace on this thing. So there we go. I'm done with that. Let's, let's talk some questions. What do you think? Good, good, good. Uh, so, so one of the questions that's come up twice is based on what you're seeing of a, a large, you know, a, a recession, but with GDP coming back after, after the third and fourth quarter, how, what do you see housing? Do you see housing, a contraction in housing at all? Or just, uh, you know, how do, what, what do you see? I think it's just like a hurricane. Um, and y'all are more used to that because it's like we are here in Houston. I think in the, the month or two or three after this, uh, we, we see a, a reduction in activity. I think as early as this is in the year, I think we'll just make up for what we lost. And I think we'll end up this year about the same as we were last year in total sales volume. What's helping offset that will be uh, our much lower, much more affordable interest rates, cheap energy. Uh, stimulus is going to help some, not everyone. Uh, that said, our biggest hit sector for y'all is going to be uh, leisure and hospitality. A lot of leisure and hospitality wasn't buying housing. They're renters because those are much typically lower paid jobs. Oh, and, and if you want to feel decimated, you don't feel sorry for yourself. Feel sorry for the people that work in bars and restaurants and cruise ships and what have you. First of all, they didn't make much to begin with. And secondly, they're taking the brunt of this big impact. And I have no doubt about that. So then that you just answered the second question. What do you think of this, the psychological impact, uh, especially in South Florida that, you know, since yesterday, you know, essential business are shutting down. Uh, you know, my, my, my answer to that is, you know, I, I, September from September 12 for the next 30 days, uh, we were all in a, in a state of shock. Uh, we had that issue with anthrax going that happened right after. And a lot of people haven't even forgotten about that. So imagine how quickly uh, resilient we are. Uh, and, and then, you know, when you show the graph, you know, the market came right back and, and, and roar in the next uh, three to six months. Uh, so what, what's your take on, on, on that uh, psychological yeah, or effect? You know, Ernesto, I'm going to agree with you. In fact, I even said this yesterday in, in one of my speeches. I think the most impacting event of my lifetime was 9-11. I, I remember, of course, I was director of investor relations for the company. We're traded on New York Stock Exchange, Stuart Title is. My thing is we'll never be the same. And my goodness, now we think this is the worst thing. And, and we only have, well, I say only. 230,000 cases worldwide when we had 60.8 million cases of H1N1 in the U.S. in 2009 alone. I sure hope that this plays out like the last two pandemics have, as I showed you in this thing. If that's the case, we're going to feel pretty smug. Not everyone. I'd like to say the leisure and hospitality people are going to be hurting. Uh, I have a good friend that owns uh, professional sports teams, casinos, and restaurants. He's I'm sure he's scrambling just to get cash flow going. And But on the other hand, uh, I think hopefully we'll look back at this uh, 12, 24 months now saying, boy, did we, we come through better than we thought we would on this one. And I think the important thing, and I want to say this, remember 88,000 people, 82,000 in, in China have said they've had this. Uh, even if they lied by a factor of 10, that's 820,000, 880,000 out of 1.4 billion people. And China now for two consecutive days has reported no new cases. So it's run its bell curve and it's coming out the other side. And hopefully that's the way the rest of the world goes on that one, except we have a shorter bell curve and don't go up as much. So another, another question that came up is, uh, since yesterday there have been some uh, uh, incentives for homeowners, uh, Bank of America announced a forbearance plan for three months. Uh, do you see the government doing something like we did in 2010 uh, remember the the cash, uh, the the closing cost uh, incentive that was rolled out to assist uh, new home buyers. Do you think that the federal government will do another type of program like that sometime in summer this year? You know, I don't think we're going to see the subsidies to the new first-time home buyers uh, like we saw back in 2010. And, and the reason is this recession is being caused by a completely different entity. Real estate caused that downturn in 08 and 09. And as a result, I mean, we overbuilt real estate. We, we, we made real estate the next get rich quick scheme. And I always joked about y'all in Florida, you didn't own one condo, you owned four of them. <laughs> and in fact, you didn't even want to sell them anymore. You didn't even want to rent them, excuse me. You only bought them. We, we, we had this neat saying in college in Texas, it's called the bigger sucker doctrine. 
you were a sucker that paid too much in hopes that a bigger sucker would come along and pay more. And that pretty much describes 2004, five, six, and seven. We were gonna get rich quick, just owning it, selling it. Forget about living in it. Forget about renting it. Just find that sucker and we can make money. And we had overbuilt dramatically and, and we've just done the opposite here. Uh, right now, there's no reason to incent people to purchase a new home. In fact, low interest rates are taking care of that as we speak. Okay. Okay. Uh, so those are the like the, the, the rest of the questions sort of similar similar to this one. Uh, you know, Ted, it, it's, it's been a pleasure to share this this morning with you. We have a, a huge attendance. As soon as you send me that PDF, I'm gonna I'm gonna share it with everybody. I think I'm a, I might reach out to you in a, in about 15 days, and, and you know, once a lot of data comes out uh, regarding unemployment uh, and stuff, I, I got another question. Yeah, another question has come in there. Um, yeah, so you know, we got a comment, you know, and, and I agree with this one. You know, spend your next, uh, you know, your next 30 days sharpening your axe, getting your 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 tools in place, contacting your database, you know, making you know making everything you need to do to 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 stay uh, to stay sharp and, and go out there. Uh, but yeah, like I, I think I might reach out to you in another 15 days once new data comes out, uh, new one new unemployment numbers come out. Uh, I mean, I, I think it's hard to pinpoint where we're gonna be in this moment because we're sort of frozen at this instant. Uh, it, it, like you know, like 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 Tess said, we just you know with the hurricane just it's it's here, it just arrived, it hasn't even left yet. So I think we gotta get past the hurricane to see where we end up. Uh, but I don't you know I I, I don't think. You know, I, I don't think that the, the effect to, to housing is that bad, uh, especially because equity, equity, everybody is equity rich right now. Everybody, Thank God. It's, it's sitting on, on plenty. I think in South Florida, uh, the Miami Association of Realtors put out something, less than 14% of homeowners have at least 7% of equity. Everybody else is 20 to 25% equity. Uh, yep. So there's, there's a lot of liquidity sitting on, 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 on real estate. So. It's not like 2008 when, uh, you know, it was the other way around. Everybody was sitting with, you know, 107% mortgages, hoping for the next big fish to, to bail them out. So, yeah, that's right. That's right. I agree with you wholeheartedly on that. All right. So thank you so much for this moment. I want to thank everybody that's watching. Uh, I'm going to post it, uh, the PDF once I get it, so you can share it with all your clients. Uh, you know, follow, you know, fo follow the uh, Ted on, uh, on, 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 Twitter, if you, you know, if you haven't found them, okay, we, I got a couple of other questions that just came up. Hold on. You bet. Um, everybody's asking for that. Uh, okay, comments. Uh, high-end condos, Miami, where do, you, where do you see those going? Well, all right, so high-end condos are, you know, those are people that have money and very often, particularly in your market, they're all cash transactions. Um, if people feel comfortable uh, that have the money uh, that want to move to a, a, a pin, you know, it's times like this that make our living at home more important to us than other things we own. And so I think there are a lot of people, I always said this after 9-11, we're going to, right after 9-11, I bought Walmart stock, I bought Home Depot, and I bought Lowe's. You still need a toilet paper and toothpaste. And I figured we're all going to be living at home for the next year. And after living at home for six months, your wife's going to say, either you remodel this kitchen or we're getting a, we get a new home or we're getting a divorce. And I think the housing becomes that much more important to us when we're around like that. So I'm actually pretty buffed about what's going on that. One of my tweets this morning was about the sales and high-end housing last year that were up so much, kind of amazing, in 2019. I, I wouldn't be surprised if that continues. So my my take on those high end condos, if it, if it, you know, the, the question was, is are they going to sell for seventy five cents on the dollar? Uh, remember that 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 that, that slide that the Ted show regarding taxation. We are the cheapest by my standard tax state in the union when you compare us to the cheaper states. Yes, you can pay cheaper cheaper taxes in Alaska. I just went to Alaska. It was a beautiful experience, but I wouldn't live in Alaska for anything in the world. So you mentioned South Dakota was the other place. South Dakota, I, yes. I have driven to South Dakota. Trust me. <laughs> you drive and drive and drive. And if you're a rancher, South Dakota is a place for you. If you're not a rancher, if you want to enjoy a lifestyle. So I, I don't know if 75 cents on the dollar is the call. I, I think that this, this, this new tax uh, bracket 
is going to look for where it's cheaper to live and have all the same amenities and lifestyle that they're used to having in, in Chicago and Manhattan. You know, that's what they're going to be looking for, uh, you know. And uh, so I don't know if 75 cents on the dollar, but I think that there's going to be, and like, you know, Ted just say, everybody's going to look for that comfort in their house. Uh, and uh, what we have built on here is, uh, is very comfortable. So, Well, I also think, if anything, if, if I were going to be a betting man, my bet was we would not get a further tax cut for the individuals. And remember that the individual tax cuts expire, but what is it, 2024? I think we have a higher probability now of extending that tax cut permanently and perhaps getting an additional tax cut, particularly on the higher end. So I would say you probably enhance the people in the high end moving to Florida. They're going to move. They were accelerated by the tax law changes a year ago. They're going to be further accelerated by any of these new changes. I think you're right on the money, Ernesto. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you, everybody, for watching. I'll be sending you the PDF information as soon as you have it. Share that information. So, so educate everybody you're working with. Uh, you know, two things that I want to say before I close. You know, you know when you get on an airplane, that you, they go through that whole routine. The first thing they tell you is put on your mask. If you put on the mask or anybody else, this is the moment to do that. Prepare for yourself. Put, put the mask on yourself. Make sure your family is ready. Make sure everybody is safe. Uh, so to, to go through the next uh, 10, 15 days that we're going to go through. Uh, but after that, you know, this presentation is a, way, a good way to reach to everybody you have in your CRM and your, and your, and your, and your database and say, hey, you know, this is, this is what everybody is, is talking about, where the economy is and where the economy could go. Uh, so I wanted to share this with you. I sat down and, and, and got educated today. Uh, and, and there's going to be a lot of more things that I'm going to be putting out and, 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 and Ted puts out things every morning. Take this 15 days, if it's 15 days, if it's 10 days, vacation that you're, that you're going to be able to take to prepare yourself, like, like, like Carlos just said, and prepare your acts. Uh, because, you know, it's, it's, we're going to take a vacation, but let's get better because the numbers look very strong uh, and the economy is very strong right now that, that can take this, uh, this, this punch to the face well, you know, to, to, to make a, 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 a reminisce to that, that painting behind you that I like so much, uh, you know, uh, as Mike Greatest. said, everybody has a plan to they get punched in the face. So, yeah, you know, you're, you're taking a punch in the face, but it doesn't mean you lost a fight. You, you only got a punch in the face. So you got you to gotta stand up and keep going. So thank you, everybody, for watching. Thank you, uh, Ted. I'll be reaching out to you in about 15 days once new data comes out to, to, to see what those, uh, those new charts look like. And I'll, and I'll be sharing with everybody. Thank you. Have a great Friday, everybody. Stay safe. Bye.